Hi everyone, this is Dr. Katherine Harris. This is English 56B and what we're going to talk about today is an introduction to Jane Eyre. And this is the volume I'm actually using for Jane Eyre. It's our Norton version. And I, I will be using and referring to page numbers in here and I'll try to remember to, to do um, chapters as well so that you can find it in case you're not using the same edition. So Jane Eyre was published in 1847 by Charlotte Bronte, it was Currer Bell. It was published by a, a company called Smith Elder, and they had a long-standing reputation in London as being really great publishers. A little background before we begin. Remember I told you about with the Romantic period, the rise of the novel itself, and the fading of poetry at the end of the Romantic period. Well, what we see coming into the Victorian period is really the heyday of the novel itself. And it was not only, uh, it was not only the purview of women or the realm of women anymore as authors, though there were an overwhelming number of women who were writing Gothic novels and just novels in general during the Victorian period. It's this particular point that we get somebody named George Eliot, who was actually a woman in writing under the pseudonym. She wrote a nonfiction piece called Silly Novels by Lady Novelists. You could find it in your Norton Anthology if you'd like to read it, but I'm just going to summarize some points for you here. Now, George Eliot was writing a satire about on novels by women and discussing the differentiation in talents. She sketches the elements of the novels by women, uh, and of course she's denigrating them. She condemns women authors for regurgitating social constraints in their writing. And she says that these women authors lack genius. Remember, genius in the Romantic period was really seen through the individual poet. Well, George Eliot's contention is that genius comes about through any sort of authorship. George Eliot also objects to incompetent or silly women novelists. She doesn't believe that every woman can actually write something that's relevant. Uh, she said that in, in this particular piece uh, that novels are mirror the women described in Jane Eyre, especially in chapter 17 of Jane Eyre, which you probably haven't gotten to yet. Jane is the only woman who writes in this novel. In fact, we start the novel with Jane writing herself into existence. Uh, the other one that's in here, Adele, can't even speak in English. For George Eliot, there's a shift from poetic genius to authorial genius. Novels started to be accepted as a valid literary form. So keep this in mind. George Eliot, as a woman, condemns other women in the way that they're right, that they're, they're actually taking all of these social constraints of the Victorians and um, mimicking them instead of pushing the boundaries, moving beyond realism. And Jane Eyre, I don't know. Maybe you guys argue that she is or she isn't one of these particular women. Now, if we take a look, I'm looking at the schedule of Tuesday for March 4th. It says, complete the readings by 10 a.m. I've asked you to read the preface in chapters 1 through 17. I've also asked you to read Kipling White Man, Kipling's White Man's Burden. That will come more into play later in Jane Eyre, but if you take a look at that one, it'll also help us when we start to talk about empire and national identity. It also says, watch the Jane Eyre video introduction lecture and begin work on the blog post due on Wednesday by 6 p.m. Now for Wednesday, the blog post that I'm going to give you will be put in the video lecture like we've done before, as well as the tag. So listen for that particular one. Let's go over to something else. So we have a variety of characters in Jane Eyre. We have Jane Eyre. She's the writer of the narrative. She's a child at first. She's a governess. She's a woman. She's her own mistress. Uh, she's going to marry somebody, but I'm not going to tell you who. We also have Mr. Edward Watt Rochester. He's the father of Adele. Uh, he's the husband to somebody else, in case you haven't read it. She has wild hair. Uh, we have uh, a woman named Bertha Mason, who you will meet in a little while. We have Adele. She's the child who is going to eventually need a governess, and that's who Jane Eyre comes to. We have Mrs. Fairchild, the housekeeper. We have Helen Burns, who, who dies from tuberculosis while at Lowood with Jane. That, that's Jane's best childhood friend. We have the Brocklehurst. They run Lowood. 
They, and they are emphatic abusers of evangelical religion. And pay attention when you read through this novel with the use of education. It's an all-girls school. Remember, school is not compulsory. Jane was sent to school as, and it had to be paid for. Um, but that means that there's not a lot of people who are governing the certification of the schools and the education itself. We're going to have Thornfield, which is Rochester's house. Look at all the naming of these places, Lowood, Thornfield. Okay. Then we have the Reed's house, which is opening up our novel. This is where Jane is tortured as a child, and she lives with distant relatives, and all those children turn out bad, and Jane is the only good one. Go, Jane. St. John Rivers is the missionary in the end, and you'll find out a little bit more about him when you read a little bit later. John Eyre is a distant relative, and you'll find about, out about him later. And Blanche Ingram is the model of female propriety. And these are all the different characters that are going to show up at different times. Okay, now, here's some plot points for you. Jane is an orphan, a governess, a teacher. She lives at Lowood and then lives at Thornfield. There's marriage, there's a fire, there's a collapse, there's a loss of identity, there's running away, there is a gothic setting, um, there is a cousin that there's a potential to marry, and there are other cousins, two women who are fine, upstanding women. There's a sense of the empire with the way that the women are described and the people are described in this particular novel. Uh, and in fact, remember the way that particularly the women are described. Dark and swarthy is not necessarily of British origin. There's a pictorial landscape. There's Jane is caught between social classes as a woman, and she develops into this woman because she's able to escape her own social classes. The fire is going to be a domestic cleansing. And then we have Grace Poole. I don't want to spoil too much for it, so hurry up and read. So there's Grace Poole, and then there's another woman named Bertha, and I won't tell you who she is. Uh, and then there's also Inheritance of Money, if you've never read Jane Eyre before. Okay, so the narrative and the literary elements. In chapter 10, a Jane claims that this is an autobiography. The narrative is done in first person retrospective, almost in the same way that we get Frankenstein. Uh, there is an autobiographical format here, and that's because of the audience. If it's done in this autobiographical format, it's not related to the Gothic setting. Uh, instead, it's not a fragmented text. Instead, what it becomes is something that's much more realistic instead of being having the audience and the readers be voyeurs. Chapters 1 through 9 represent the first 10 years of life for Jane, and then it skips ahead. Uh, the retrospective narrative is limited by adult memory, uh, and it's got a, there's sometimes a passive apology for any potential misrememberings as you get past chapter 10. Most of her memories are tied to a place, the Reed's house, Lowood, Thornfield. And it's autobiographical by admission to lend authority to the narrative itself. Bertha Mason, she's described as wild, violence, insane, cognizant of deception, angry as all get out. And she's Ro uh, Rochester's double from a psychoanalytical point of view. I don't know if you could call her a doppelganger. You might be able to argue that, but I'm not sure that we would. And you'll also notice that there's no mothers. There's only replacements. In chapter 12, we meet Adele. And Adele needs a mother, and Jane becomes not just a governess, but a mother too. There's some theoretical points that I want you to pay attention to. There's a representation of women in Victorian novels. It's a novel of development and self-realization. It's not quite the novel that we have the Buildings Roman, where it's the growth of the individual character. We also don't, I don't know if we have a Byronic hero still here. I'll wait to see how what you think at the end of the novel. Jane represents the feminine spirit who tames the unwieldy masculine passion. And this is going to be, or she attempts to with Rochester up through chapter 17. And it represents the missing or dead mother of the tale, Jane does. And she's essentially an orphan with many matronly stand-ins. So the representation of no mothers, this happens through a lot of novels, and especially in the Victorian period, which is odd because infant mortality rate, uh, birth rates soar, uh, death during um, labor 
declines. So it's not really clear why in particular that we have all these authors killing off their mothers, the seat of everything. Maybe you should write about that. We'll see. Jane never receives a mother and she gains redemption only through herself. She always only forgives herself. Bertha Mason is the untamable masculine female whose passions both destroy and cleanse domesticity. She's locked away by a recalcitrant husband. See, this is why you should read before, because <laughs> then I'm spoiling things for you. She's locked away by Rochester, who could be signified that he's denying his own passions by doing this in his own wild nature. Bertha Mason is described as wild hair, and when we have the flames that occur, um, that we're going to find out later, she, we have her hair is on fire. That's the first thing that goes up. And Rochester represents himself as being a gentleman. So he married this woman and then locked her away in the attic when she went crazy. And so when he does that, he, he locks away this wild side of himself. The other representations of women in this novel in terms of marriage, there seems to be a duty to marriage and a duty to religion instead of love. Um, there's also economic enfranchisement. Money equals freedom, especially for Jane. There's a conflict between religion and love. Uh, the crazed evangelical Brocklehurst of her Lowood days also compared to the or represent the impact of religion. And Jane provides a critique to this overly emphatic cult of discipline. When she's at Lowood, she's miserable and she's punished horribly. Domesticity becomes the forefront of the novel as Jane freely chooses to aid Rochester because, because of something that's going to happen by the end of the novel. Jane upholds the division of labor between men and women of the Victorian time period. She continuously helps Rochester even as Adele's um, nanny or tutor, as they would call her. She becomes everyone's eyes and ears, even in this autobiographical moment. Now, there's a textuality to this particular novel, and the textuality comes in, fo in the form of the women author who is very apparent in Jane herself. Jane is the narrator. Uh, Charlotte Bronte is the woman author. It's the production of the self through the writing. And Jane, as the adult, writes this narrative out and she's writing the development of herself as that adult remembers it. And so this is probably the reason why she skips over those years after chapter 10 and then we just suddenly see her. She's got a job and, and um, she is a tutor to Adele at that particular time, leaves the school and makes something of herself. But we also see at that time that she becomes a self-actualized individual who makes decisions and then stands up for them after chapter 10. The setting is gothic despite being well into the Victorian period. Um, it's away from Radcliffe and Lewis who really began the gothic tradition, the romantic period, as we see with the names of the places. The places become very central. It's not a castle, but we do get grand um, grounds. There's an invisible transmission of Jane's narrative. How does it reach publication that's never discussed? And now that's something that was inherent to the Gothic because we always had that it was a fragment or something lost or somebody translated it. We don't see that here because it becomes unimportant. Continuing on with the, with the Victorian, um, with this idea of textuality, as the readers, we have to trust that Jane is truthful in her fairy tale like life that allows the orphan to gain control of herself. It's very different than what you've experienced with some of the Dickens serials that you're reading. There's orphans everywhere and they all die or something happens to them. Uh, the author in, in Jane Eyre has a consciousness within the narrative that's not broken throughout, except those eight years that's narrated with a blip. Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Bronte collapses time and allows Jane to acknowledge that and allows a living text or narrative in a linear history that's easy for readers to comprehend and follow. You could actually sketch out a timeline of Jane. The memory seems recent. It's not distant. So emotions are still fresh and they're really written that way. The narrative produces an identity, a, a discourse in the Victorian period. And the language allows Jane to become Jane Eyre and to become her own mother. So she's writing herself into existence, then she's procreating. 
I know it's a little bit weird, but think about it is that she is her own mother to herself. She ends the novel in a certain way, in a certain state of physical being. I'm not going to spoil any of that for you. You'll know at the end. Um, the archive itself. Jane, with writing herself into existence and giving birth to herself, creates an archive or a history of herself, but with no ending. Her life continues after the novel concludes, but we're taken only up to the point of her now, her living happily ever after. Um, we're not really sure if it's temporary or if it will continue on. Reader, will, reader you will never know. Uh, the last chapter ends up being an afterword. She's writing 10 years later after the con conclusion of the big thing that happens at the end of the book. She's talking to her cousins and Adele and uh, St. John Rivers. Now, the British didn't call him, say St. John. They would say St. Jin Rivers. Uh, the narrative has some blank spaces where Jane was not the witness to events and she has to be filled in a little bit later. We see that at the end of the novel where she needs to be told what's happened. We get some afterings of this particular novel because there are some blank spaces. Who is Bertha Mason? Who is Rochester? What are their histories? So Jean Reese writes Wide Sargasso Sea, which we're slated to read a little bit later. It's a Victorian aftering. It tells of Bertha Mason's origins. Rochester's story is not really expanded from the time um, she leaves, the time that Jane leaves, until she uh, arrives again and finds him again. We don't really know what, what he's been doing. It's not important to our narrative. Jane is really our heroine here. Charlotte Bronte wrote this particular novel under a pseudonym of Kerr Bell, and she wrote it as she thought a man would write a particular novel. And she uh, used the initials instead of Kerr Bell itself. She denies her own identity and writes herself out of the prim primary authority because she misidentifies herself in the name it itself. So what happened, what that means is that writing under a pseudonym for Charlotte Bronte is that she's created a fictional character to be the author of this particular novel. Um, it becomes a public self. Uh, instead of Charlotte Bronte, it's Kerr Bell. And Kerr, Charlotte Bronte itself never becomes a commodified name during her own lifetime. It was much later that it was revealed she wrote Jane Eyre. Um, Charlotte Bronte's writing standard stands without its creator because of this veil. Yeah. Now, the woman question, and this is a big question throughout all of the Victorian period, it's the new woman that we see that later comes up in, if you read Dracula. Um, questions of inequality, sexual inequality, political, economic, education, and the social intercourse. We see this come up in some particular areas, and I want to take us over to the book. Pardon my fidgeting <laughs> in Chapter 7. Uh, chapter 7 on fundamentalism and talking about hair and dress, and I'm just on page 54 and 55. So on page 54, uh, it's uh, Miss Temple and Julia Severn. It is Julia Severn, replied Miss Temple very quietly. Julia Severn, ma'am, and why has she or any other curled hair? Why, in defiance of every precept and principle of this house, does she conform to the world so openly? Here, in an evangelical charitable establishment, as to wear her hair one mass of curls. Julia's hair curls naturally, returned Miss Temple still more quietly. Naturally, yes, but we are not to conform to nature. That's very different than the romantics, right? I wish these girls to be the children of grace. And why that abundance? I have again and again intimated that I desire the hair to be arranged closely, modestly, plainly. Miss Temple, that girl's hair must be cut off entirely. I will send a barber tomorrow. And I see others who have far too much of the excrescence. That tall girl, tell her to turn around. Tell all the first form to rise up and direct their faces to the wall. So we ha there's a, there's an attempt at social control through the hair itself. And now women at this particular time would send locks of hair to their suitors and put it in a little locket and that those kinds of things would be kept. There were a lot of women who had Lord Byron's, a lock of Lord Byron's hair and kept on to that because he was a little bit of a Lothario. But the Miss Temple, this was an attempt to control the girls and bring them into some sort of social line in order to control their control hair. 
control them, control society, control politics, control the definition of femininity through their hair. Wildness, nature, was no longer acceptable. Later down on page 54, almost to the very end, it starts, Mr. Brock, Mr. Brocklehurst was here interrupted. Three other visitors, ladies, now entered the room. They ought to have come a little sooner to have heard his lecture on dress, for they were splendidly attired in velvet, silk, and furs. The two younger of the trio, fine girls of 16 and 17, had gray beaver hats, then in fashion, shaded with ostrich plumes, and from under the brim of this graceful headdress fell a profusion of light tresses, elaborately curled. The elder lady was enveloped in a costly velvet shawl, trimmed with ermine, and she wore a false front of French curls. These women are very um, decadently attired, and they are, representation, they are a representation of society and upper-class society. So immediately upon getting a lecture on dress and curls, we have these women come in, and they said these ladies were deferential, re received by Miss Temple as Mrs. and the Mrs. Brocklehurst and conducted to seats of honor at the top of the room. What's the difference between these two? The girls are castigated, but these women are allowed to come in in all of their decadence. In chapter 12, on page 93, we again return to this idea of the woman question. And I'm going to go over to that right now. At the beginning of chapter 12, we see the promise of a smooth career which my first calm introduction to Thornfield Hall seemed to pledge was not belied on a longer acquaintance with the place and its inmates. Mrs. Fairfax turned out to be what she appeared, a placid-tempered, kind-natured woman. So it goes on to chronicle Adele and Mrs. Um, Mrs. Fairfax, uh, as well as the place where she's going to live. But there are no mothers. There are a lot of women, but there are no mothers. If we continue on to page 93, still in chapter 12, um, just a little bit further into it, there's a, uh, a paragraph that says, Who blames me? Uh, and then it says, It is in vain to say human beings ought not to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action. And they will make it if they cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine, and millions are in silent revolt against their lot. Nobody knows how many rebellions besides political rebellions ferment in the masses of life which people earth. Women are supposed to be very calm, generally. Now, this, is, this should resonate with you as Mary Wollstonecraft. Vindications. But women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties and a field for their efforts as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer, and it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow creatures to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It is thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or learn more than custom that is pronounced necessary for their own sex. So Charlotte Bronte mouthing Mary Wollstonecraft, and we see this resonant come, it's almost exactly what Wollstonecraft was saying for the vindication of the rights of woman. Now, what happens with Jane is that she sees that she's into a moral and ethical dilemma as she's living in Thornfield. She falls in love with Rochester, who's a dark, swarthy, mysterious man. But all the while she's living in Thornfield, she hears these mysterious laughs. And she thinks it's Grace Poole. And she thinks that Grace Poole is a drunk and living in the attic and sneaks around until she starts noticing that things are missing. Now, meanwhile, she's falling in love with Rochester and she gets to the point that she agrees to marry him. The nanny is marrying the boss. It, it started way before we had the real housewives or anything like that. Well, what happens when she gets to marry Rochester, as you'll find out from the reading, is that it's revealed he's already married. And so he's attempting to become a polygamist and to pull Jane in with him. He's married to Bertha Mason, who lives up in the attic. Now, Bertha has already burned the veil um, that was meant for Jane's wedding day. And so what, what we see is that he didn't trust her with this huge secret. So she literally finds out on her wedding day when she was supposed to marry Rochester. Um, and it, after, it was only after it was publicly displayed did she find out something. Somebody comes in and does the big dun-dun-dun reveal to him. 
But the, th the odd thing is that Jane becomes the receptacle of shame instead of Rochester or Bertha. And only when she leaves the house does she really reject the guilt heaved upon her by these Victorian standards. You can see that the Jane who's educated uh, at, by, uh, early on is a very is a very different woman than the Jane who decides to leave Thornfield. By this time, she's taking it upon herself. She doesn't have a plan. She doesn't have money. She sleeps in a barn, things like that. But she thinks that she must get away. It's very wild of her to do this. Um, she, she, When she leaves, she rejects this, this guilt, but she takes it with her in the next decisions that she's going to make in the second half of the book. So if we go back and take a look at the schedule, you have a blog post that's due. Uh, that's due on uh, Wednesday at 6 p.m. The prompt should be Jane. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the tag should be Jane Eyre. And the actual prompt is that there are two versions of Jane in this novel, the one in chapters 1 through 10, and then after chapter 10 and into chapter 12 when she goes to Thornfield. So what I would like you to write about, how does Jane create herself in her, and her power? <coughs> Excuse me. How does Jane create herself and her power? You're writing a comparison of Jane in the early days in the Red Room where she's terrified and she's with uh, all of her relatives who lock her in there versus the Jane who lives in Thornfield and makes a decision to leave because she doesn't want to be part of this circle. Right? Write a comparison the Jane in the Red Room as a child versus the Jane in Thornfield and the one who leaves. How does she create herself and her power between these two moments? And that should be 350 words. Again, the tag is Jane Eyre. Okay, I'll see you for the next one.